Hello and welcome back to Russ's Movie Corner. My name is Russ and as you can see I am sitting in front of my movie corner. I have my Armor of God t-shirt on, my Gospel of John movie right next to me. And judging by the frame around me, we are back taking down another agnostic slash atheist. This is Inspiring Philosophy's Top 10 Biblical Problems for Young Earth Creationism. Um, before I get into it, I just want to say, um, as of this week of filming it, Happy Easter to you, wherever you are. Um, <clears throat> that being said, when last we left off, um, Inspiring Philosophy was going off about um, this whole thing, um, about this notion of they shall become one flesh. You know, oh, if they take it literally, then that means that they that they have to be sewn together so that they become one flesh. That's not what becoming one flesh means. Um, if we look at, let me grab, uh, let me see here. All right. Let's look out. Greek word there is bizarre, means flesh, the soft tissue mass of any animal, the whole body, particular parts of the body, meat, skin, genitals, etc. By extension, humankind, living things. Okay. That is also the place where um, it is used as um, when. God takes out the rib out of the man, says, and close up the place with flesh. Um, now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Um, and the two shall become one flesh. Um, it's also in Genesis 17 when he's making the covenant with Adam. He's saying, um, you know, uh, in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Okay. So pretty much almost anywhere that it mentions flesh. Um, the only time it's a little different is when um, in in the first five books of Moses, actually, until actually 2 Samuel, um, the only time that it's different is when it's talking about in Leviticus or a white spot appears in the raw flesh of an animal or something like that when it's talking about the... Uh, um, or when it's talking about like leprosy and it's talking about like skin diseases and stuff like that. Um, that is 46.95. That is... Mia, which is saving of a life, raw flesh, food, sustenance, relief, recovering. Um, it's translated as raw flesh once. And that's the only part where it's talking about flesh. Is It's a different f type of flesh. It's just talking about like if you have something that appears, it's raw, it's red, it's, you know, and then there's like a white spot in it. That's what they're talking about. Okay. Um, now, the word one there is 285 285 is jihad it's a numeral it's one a certain one first so basically um that's yeah that's basically they're just talking there about the two will become one flesh flesh as in um is it 14 14 it's going to be a little different on Strong's, but 
basically it's kind of the same thing. It's basically just talking about the two will become, you know, one. And when it's talking about, it says flesh, the soft tissue mass of any animal, the whole body, particular parts of the body, meat, skin, genitals, etc. By extension, humankind, living things. And so, <clears throat> it it seems as though he's not understanding that when it's talking about the two will become one flesh, it's it's talking about it's not talking about them literally becoming one flesh. It's talking about procreation, okay? And it's not a metaphor for having offspring. It's the literal thing of what happens, okay? It, it, it doesn't matter who you're with, okay? If you have sex with that person, parts of you become parts of them, okay? And if you have offspring with that person, because it will only happen between a man and a woman, but if you have an offspring with a woman, if you was a man, okay, have offspring with a woman, that is your two DNA, okay, your two parts of your flesh becoming one, right? So, obviously, he doesn't seem to understand that that's what they're talking about there, okay? So let's jump back in, let's continue on with this, and we'll, and we'll see what else he has to say. Verse 24 is obviously metaphorical language, but that means the text of Genesis 1 and 2 could also be using other metaphors. It was not meant to be entirely literal. And how do you know that? Hmm? How do you know that? Were you there when Moses wrote it down? Were you there when God created the earth? Oh, I'm sorry, for a second I thought you were trying to imply that you were. Okay? This is the problem with atheism, agnosticism, when they try to, like, point at certain parts and say, well, if you're taking that as metaphor, then why can't we take all of this as metaphor? Because that's not what the words say. You have to look at the context of things, okay? God is not saying, okay, in Genesis 2.24... Okay, for a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Okay, he's not saying that. Oh, they start to like meld together, a la the the thing when in in twenty eleven the prequel to the thing called the thing, where like the guys like literally like you know morphing onto the other guy and his skin's literally melting into the other guy's flesh. That's not what they're talking about here. Okay, that word joined or cleaved, I mean, you can look at it in, you know, five or six different ways, <clears throat> but, because it's been translated a bunch of different ways, but it's usually translated joined. Um, this one is translated united. So let's look up united in the NIV's strongest concordance. So we will look up united. Fifteen. Okay. That is the back. To be united, hold fast, keep, cling to, to overtake, cause to cleave, press hard upon, to be joined fast, to be stuck together, to be made to cleave, stick to, from the base joining or fastening objects together comes the figure of close association for people. So like a fastener, okay, like a fastener, the two are fastened together. What do you think that means? If not procreation. Fastening. Do I need to spell it out for you? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Like, come on. Okay? I think the King James says, 
shall cleave unto his wife. And I think, um, let me see here. Where is the King James translation? I believe the King James says to cling to or cleave to. Yeah, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Okay? And that's basically what they're talking about there is that the cleaving is the joining, the fastening. Okay? It's a metaphor for marriage, yes, but it's also the act of procreation because it's fastening. How do you think you fasten to someone? You're not going to be sewn to them. That's a dumbass statement. Okay? What are you going to do? It's literally talking about procreation, dude. And if you can't understand that, I can't help you. Okay? <laughs> Number seven. Genesis 3.22 Genesis 3 recounts the fall of Adam and Eve in the exile from the Garden of Eden. Young Earth creationists believe before this there was no death because God made everything perfect. Yes. Because nowhere in the Bible does something die until or is recorded to die until Genesis 3 where God kills some animals to make skins for the man and the woman. In fact, it even says at the end of 22 or verse 2 25 they were naked and felt no shame duh i mean that's the point isn't it am i wrong okay if they felt no shame there was no need for death now we don't know how long Adam lived until he was kicked out of the garden. We know he lived 900 years. Okay? The Bible's clear on that. And when I think he was 130, he begat Seth. Let me double check. Just so I don't have people going, you don't know anything. Yeah, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, and after his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Okay? So, that means that, yes, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden until sin took over. Okay, so was there death in the garden? Probably not, because it's clear in Revelation that it says that things are going to be restored when Jesus returns back to pre-flood conditions, basically Garden of Eden type conditions, okay, where there will be no pain, no death, no suffering, only joy, only happiness, duh, if Jesus is saying that in Revelation, then don't you think that it was probably that way in the garden? Where do you think we get that from, dude? This is the problem with non-Christians who don't know what the Bible actually says trying to tell us Christians what the Bible says. Okay? Like, we don't know. Stop. So Adam and Eve would have had to have been created immortal, and the fall resulted in their bodies being made mortal. No, not necessarily. They were just long-lived. Because the, the conditions inside the, the garden, okay, if you take the Hoven theory for what it is, again, it's a theory, that there was an ice sheet about three or four fingers thick of ice around the entire around the entire world, okay, that was pressurizing the oxygen down near the ground, they would have lived for a long time. Okay? And at the time of the flood, that would have burst up 
and broken that ice canopy and then it would have taken a while for that air to settle out into the atmosphere that we see today okay where that oxygen would have would have been spread out more to where now we only have like 21% oxygen where before they probably had like 32% oxygen because that's what we see in air bubbles trapped in ice and amber okay so you were saying because he lived for 900 years his descendants lived for 800 years some other of his descendants lived 700 years then after the flood they started at about four to five hundred years and then they went down to 200 and within about three or four generations they were down to a hundred so something happened they weren't immortal okay God didn't say that he created them immortal hence the reason for verse 22 again this is IP isogeting into the text oh well God would, would have had to have made them immortal and then after the fall he would have had to have made them mortal no because nowhere in there does it say that we are descendant from God no we were made from the dust we were mortal from the first breath that much is clear we were made in the image of God not like shaved off of God does that make sense people seem to think that because we are made in the image of God somehow we're like you know this way but that's not what he said it's never what he said okay said so we are made in the image of God people seem to think that that statement means that oh no we're a reflection of God that's what image means okay he formed Adam out of the dust breathed into his nostrils caused him to fall asleep pulled a rib out after bringing him all the animals pulled a rib out okay closed up the place and then made woman and he said here you go put the two of them together in the garden and they were naked and they felt no shame doesn't say they were immortal never said that that is an assumption by IP and consequently death came as a result no nah. death was the absolute result of the fall okay God said okay Let me go back and read this, okay? <clears throat> Starting in verse 15 of chapter 2. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work in it, to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, that doesn't mean that the minute he took a bite of the apple or whatever the fruit was, okay, that doesn't mean that he died. No. It means spiritual death it means separation from god that was the rebellion that he was talking about okay and then because they did god said okay to adam because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which i commanded you you shall not eat of it cursed is the ground because of you in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return okay now god doesn't say you were once immortal adam and now because you did this you die no he says okay 
you're going to have to work in the dust because that's where you came from and that's where you're going back to eventually. You're going to die. We were mortal from the beginning, son. That much is clear. Okay? The curse was, you're going to work the ground until you die. Or until you can't physically do it anymore, then someone will take care of you until you die. Okay? So, obviously, IP doesn't understand that the Bible never said that we that that humans were somehow miraculously immortal until we sinned and then all of a sudden we were we were mortal we were made mortal or something like that they never said that the Bible never said that okay so don't think it that's part of the little God's heresy okay that Oh, we're all just little gods with God. No, we're not. We're pale reflections. Imperfect reflections of the perfect creator. Never, ever forget that. However, Genesis 3 never says their bodies were changed or transformed to be mortal. God curses the ground, but never places any curse on their bodies. Yeah, and he never had to because they were never immortal, son. Get it through your head. They were never immortal. That's on you. That's on you. Not the text. Because Moses writing this from God, okay, was never like, oh, hey, wait, God, um, w were they immortal? No, he understood they were mortal from the beginning. Do I need to look up image? Do we seriously need to do that? Because it sounds like we do. Because it sounds like this guy doesn't really understand, okay, what image means in the Hebrew because obviously he doesn't understand that image doesn't mean immortal okay oh come on you Five, twelve, And again, if you're following along on Strong's Concordance, it's going to be a little different. All you have to do is go to the, the Strong's Online free on, I think it's kingjamesbible.com. You can, you can access a, um, a Strong's Concordance, or you can just search Strong's Online Concordance free and just click on, it's like it's like all in capital letters, the Strong's Concordance, and it's like kjv.com or something like that. And you click on it, and then you type in image, Okay, because I believe in the in that one. That's what it says. We will look very quickly because I don't want people to be like, "Didn't you what he did?" Yeah. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created a male and female. He created them. So yeah, still His image. Okay, <clears throat> and it'll be a little like I said. It'll be a little different because Strong's the. The words are the same, but the the order that they're written in is a little different from this version, which is the NIV exhaustive concordance in the vein of Strong's and the actual Strong's. Okay. And we were looking at 7512. CLM. Image, usually referring to an object of worship, idol, idols, image, model, f figures, untranslated. Okay. 
And that's probably where most people get this whole doctrine of like, oh, see, it says image, usually referring to an object of worship, idol, idols. No, image is God creating us like you would create an idol, okay? It's a reflection of what you think that God looks like. So think about Hinduism. There's 33,000 gods in Hinduism, and each one has a little statue. Each one is an image of what those people think that God looks like. Okay? When we sit down and a painter paints a picture of Jesus, that is an image of what that artist represents, what he thinks Jesus could be. Okay? That's it. So it's, it's basically a reflection Okay, of what God God created us in his image. Okay? Doesn't make us little gods, doesn't make us immortal. It's just he formed Adam out of the dust in his image. He formed the woman out of the dust in his image. Okay? He formed male and female in his image, in his likeness, because he wanted someone to worship him. Okay? He saw all this creation and created all these animals. And he was like, the animals really don't have a consciousness, a spirit. So let us create man. Adam. Okay? That's what man is. We call it Adam. Okay? That's what we call the first man is Adam, but it's Adam. Okay? Like Amin, where we say Amen, Amen. Okay? It's Amin in in the actual Hebrew it means let it be or so it so be it. Okay. It's the same thing. Okay. He doesn't have to indicate some magical transformation from immortal to mortal because it never happened. Except in IP's mind. In fact, all he does is bar them from the tree of life. Verse yeah. twenty two reads. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. That's because when he created the angels in heaven, he created the angels knowing good and evil. Okay? And lest we forget that God is in three persons. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay? They knew good and evil. Man was supposed to rely on one person in the garden to know what they were supposed to do. And what was that person supposed to be? God. Okay? If Adam had a question, he would walk over to God. Hey, God, got a question for you. What about this? Yeah, that's good. Or, no, don't do that. Okay, thank you. His moral compass was pointing towards God all the time. Because he lived in perfect harmony with God. God would walk through the garden day after day. Okay? And he would see man and woman doing things. He would walk up. How was your day? How did this happen? How did that happen? Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, we wanted to know about this. Yeah, here's what you do. All that changed when they ate from that tree. Because... That's the point. Free will, son. Okay? Atheists always always come at me with this. Oh, well, why would God put that in? Because God was testing the man to see how obedient he'd be. He gave him free will because he didn't want robots. He already had robots. They were basically the animals. Okay? He wanted somebody who would freely choose to come to him and say, How do I do this? What do I do in this situation? What do I do here? What do I do there? And God gave him one command. One command only. You see that tree right there. That one tree. Don't eat of that one. For if you do, you will surely die. That wasn't physical death. It was spiritual death. And Adam told his wife, he said, Hey, you know what? That tree over there, we don't eat of it. And the serpent a.k.a. Satan, the devil, okay, came to Eve and was like, 
Did God really say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And she said, Oh no, we can have every tree except for that one. For if we eat of it, we will die. And he says, Oh, you will surely not die. Yes, they did. Now, it wasn't because they were suddenly immortal or suddenly mortal because they ate of the fruit. So, this kind of shoots down his actual argument. He's literally owning himself here. Because this flies in the face of his own theory of them becoming mortal and then having to eat of a tree to live forever. <laughs> and yes, Adam could have freely ate from that tree at any point. He didn't. Because obviously we're all mortals. And you know what? We'll never have the chance. Because we pump those into our cars. Duh. Garden of Eden is gone, folks. It's gone forever. Until Jesus comes back. And so, if IP wants to stand there and think, well, hey, well, they, if they were supposedly immortal, and then they became immortal, or they were immortal, and then they became mortal, and then they, they would eat the fruit, of, and then they would become more immortal again? No, they were never immortal to begin with. That's the point. That's why God is saying... Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Duh! And that's why the cherubim sat there with the flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Because he didn't want man to live forever in his knowledge of good and evil and sin. Okay? That's the point, son. You missed it completely because you're isogening so hard into the text that somehow Adam had to be immortal. He wasn't. Because you're thinking in temporal terms today. Oh, most people live to be 80, 90, maybe 100. Wow. Adam could only have lived 900 years old to be 900 years old if he was immortal. No. He was the first being. He was perfect. And you'll notice that every single successive generation didn't live as long as Adam. And after the flood, that lifespan drastically decreased. Which means that there was something that had to have happened to the atmosphere that caused them from living 400 to living 200 and then 100. So, obviously, IP is the one who just owned himself with this. Because this debunks his own notion. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. And he's just spinning his wheels, okay, trying to come up with anything that makes his ideas sound good and everyone else's sound like crap. Instead of just reading the Bible for what it is. No, I got to eisegete into the Bible because if I can debunk the Bible, then, you know, I can show those Christians, ha, ha, ha. Son, you're not showing anybody by shaking your fist at God. If anything, you're just making yourself look more foolish. I'm sorry that I can't help you see that. The implication numerous scholars have pointed out is Adam and Eve were already mortal, and the only way they obtained immortality in the garden was eating continuously from the tree of life. To make them more... No. I, I've never heard a single biblical scholar say that. Okay? I have never heard a single biblical scholar say that. 
Almost every biblical scholar that I talk to or that I've heard talk about the fall of man and talk about Genesis chapter 2 is that man was mortal. From the beginning, man was mortal. And maybe living in close proximity to God is what gave him the longevity. Who knows? But again, he was made perfect. Okay, His DNA was perfect. His form was perfect. Everything about him was perfect. Because God said it was good. And when the Creator says it was good, it was good. And then Adam and Eve had to go and mess it all up for the rest of us. Okay? I don't know if any of these guys at the bottom here, okay, and actually right here, okay, the, the one that's behind me is Joshua Van, John Van E, okay, I don't know if these guys are actual Christians, okay, I don't, I don't have access to the internet right here and I can't look them up. Okay, but if they are, and they're and they're the ones saying, you know, huh, you know, they they eat from the tree daily, and so they live forever. I, I don't think so. Okay, I, I don't think that's what happened. So again, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden. Okay, and it's obvious that Adam was not formed as a baby and then grew up. He was formed as a fully formed man. Okay? So was Eve. Their sons, Cain and Abel, and their other sons and daughters and Seth and everybody else were born. But those two were not born in the traditional sense. They were created. Fully formed man, fully formed woman. Okay? And like I said, we don't know how long they stayed in the garden before they were cast out. The Bible doesn't tell us. After Cain and Abel, it tells us how long Adam lived. So sometime between his creation and 130, they lived in the garden, they were cast out of the garden, they had Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel, Cain goes off to live somewhere else, and then Adam has Seth. Okay? And then in the meantime, they had other sons and daughters as well. Okay? So, obviously, IP is trying to grasp at straws, okay, trying to find any little gleaning he can to try to think of this immortality garbage. And that's what it is. It's garbage. Because he made it up in his own mind and now he's trying to eisegete that into the text and then trying to say, well, the, well then, why is God saying that they can't? They have to go to the tree of life and then live forever? Because if they ate from the tree of life, they would have lived forever. Now, as far as we know, because the Bible doesn't tell us, as far as we know, they didn't eat from the tree Because God's implication was if they ate from the tree, they would live forever. That's the implication there in that statement. Okay? Let's read it one more time because obviously, you know, we can't understand subtext. Okay? Then Yahweh God said, See, the man has become like one of us with his knowledge of good and evil. He must not be allowed to stretch his hand out next and pick from the tree of life also and eat some of it and eat some and live forever. So the implication there in that verse is that they never ate from that tree. 
Because if they had, they would have lived forever. God would have said, let us make man mortal, for he has eaten from the tree of life, and he should not live forever with the knowledge of good and evil. No, he says, okay, he must not be allowed to stretch his hand out next and pick from the tree of life also and eat some and live forever. Which means that Adam never touched the tree of life either. And God was worried that if he did, he would live forever and that sin would never, ever, ever go away. So, God would have had to have changed his statement from, lest he pick it, lest he stretch out his hand and pick from the tree and eat the fruit and live forever, to, lest he continue to eat from the tree or let us make man mortal now because he's been eating from the tree of life and he's immortal so let's make him mortal so that he will die and we'll banish him from the garden he never said that so obviously ip is sitting here reading through this not understanding the text eisegeting into the text that somehow <laughs> God, you know, God made Adam and Eve immortal and then didn't bother to have Moses record that he made them mortal and then somehow put in this verse in here that s doesn't make any sense to me because they should have been made mortal. Because they were never immortal, son. That's the point. Read the text. And when I say read the text, I'm not saying, oh, just lazily read. I'm saying read it, son. Absorb it into your brain. Understand what it's trying to tell you. You obviously have never done that, IP. That's what we say when we say read the text. We're saying don't cherry pick verses. Don't eisegete your own worldview into it. Read it for what it says. The verse literally tells you what they're doing. And you want to stand there and say, Oh, well, God, God, God made them immortal. And then he said, and then he never said that he made them mortal. And so why would he put this verse in there? Because they were never immortal. Seriously, man. Like, my God, how many times do I have to say it? Okay? He keeps harping on this point when the verse literally contradicts what he just said. Let's move on. This is getting stupid. Mortal again. All God had to do was prevent access to this sacred tree. But that means humans were already mortal before the fall and were only granted immortality through a special fruit. Not because they were... And it doesn't say that. Again... The Bible doesn't say that. Okay? Now, did Adam eat from the tree of life? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Okay? Literally in Genesis chapter 2, okay, God forms the man out of the dust, causes the plants and the animals to be to come to him, okay? Breathes into him, has the plants and animals come to him, he does all this stuff, puts him in the garden, says, here, work. And then he goes, hmm, I don't think it's good for the man to be alone. Let's make a helper. So he forms the woman. Okay. Well, first he brings all the animals to him. Adam names all the animals. And then, and then the Lord goes, huh, didn't find a suitable helper for him. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Causes him to fall asleep, takes his rib out, forms the woman, brings him to the man, and marriage is born. Okay. And they were naked and they felt no shame. That's it. That's chapter 2, folks. And then in chapter 3 is when the serpent comes in and goes, Hey, did God really say? And, and Eve is like, yeah, well, you know, I mean, he just said this one tree. Now, are, you implying, are people implying that because she said we can freely eat of any tree, are they saying that they ate from the tree? No. They had free access to every tree but one. Doesn't mean they ate from every tree. They just had access to every tree. 
but one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. That's the one God said don't eat from. And they ate from it. So yes, the implication was that they were mortal. Okay? And then God was like, they could take from this tree and live forever. Let's not. Because the implication is that the tree gives them immortality. The fruit of the tree. Not that they're eating it constantly. It's if they stretch out and take the fruit, they live forever. They take it and eat it. They live forever. Just like the knowledge of good and evil. They just ate, they just ate a bit of it. They didn't have to eat the whole fruit. Okay? It says she she saw that the, the, the fruit was pleasing to the eye, and it was good for food, and so she plucked it down, and she, she ate some, and she gave some to her husband who was standing right there. And then it says their eyes were opened. So they didn't have to eat the whole fruit, okay, continually to get the knowledge of good and evil. They just ate one bite or two bites or however many bites they took. And then they were like, oh my god, we're naked. So it doesn't say. So if people are running around and going, oh, hey, Adam lived so long because he was eating from that. Well, then why did he live another 800 years afterwards? Or 930, I guess. He lived a total of 930 after he begat Seth. So, why? If he had eaten the fruit of the tree, he would have been immortal. And God would have changed his statement from, lest he take out and, you know, and, 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 and take stretch out his hand and take the fruit and eat it and become immortal and live forever basically become immortal to we need to prevent them from stretching out their hand and taking more of the of the tree of life so that they will die someday or something like that but God doesn't say that and God doesn't make mistakes IP you do I do everybody does but not God and if he told Moses, this is what happened in the Garden of Eden, and this is what happened, and this is what I told them, and this is what happened, and I told them, no, because you're going to eat this, and blah, blah, blah. That's how it happened. Because God doesn't lie, son. Created with immortal bodies. This is also supported by the fact that Adam is called dust, which is an idiom in the Bible to denote that one is mortal. Duh. In Genesis, it might just be metaphorical language to denote that he was a mortal human, meaning Adam was mortal before the fall, which implies that death was a possibility before sin entered. No. The the death I I, I think what you're grasping at here, IP, is that Adam and Eve likely were getting their longevity originally from God. Just having God around them, okay, was feeding them and sustaining them with his energy. It's likely that they could have lived for thousands of years before finally, you know, before God maybe let them rest okay we don't know because sin entered the garden and with that sin comes the penalty of death but yes they were mortal the thing is we will never know because Adam and Eve screwed it all up for the rest of us Okay? So we will never know what that was like until Christ comes back and sets up his eternal kingdom here. Then we'll know. 
But until then, what the Bible says, the Bible says. Never said they were immortal. So you literally just contradicted your own point by saying, well, they were immortal, ha ha ha. No, they were mortal. And most Bible scholars understand that. Number 6. Genesis 2-4 Young Earth creationists often argue that Genesis 2 is a recap of what takes place on day 6 within Genesis 1, when God made humans. But Genesis 2-4 poses a problem for suggesting this chapter is a recap. The verse begins with, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is what scholars call a toledoth, and it is used throughout Genesis, almost like chapter markers for the ancient audience. Yeah, and? However, when this phrase is used, it always introduces what comes after the person or the generations that follow him. It is never used to denote a recap of something that happened prior to this. Biblical scholar John Walton notes that the phrase in Genesis 2 is probably teaching the same idea and that what takes place in Genesis 2 is meant to be a sequel, not a recap of what happens in Genesis 1. After God establishes the cosmos, he then hones in on one region on the earth to create a garden environment. But this would mean what is commonly viewed as the creation of the first man in Genesis 2 is not actually the creation of the first man. Since in the prequel to Genesis 2, God elects all humans to be his image, and this would take place before Genesis 2, and before Adam is believed to have been created from dust. Okay. So, <clears throat> this came up in my Christy Burke video, um, in one of my Christy Burke videos, um, where she was like, you know, she was like, well, I mean, like, how could, how could there not be plants if God created plants? And how could there not be the... I'm like, this is a patch of ground somewhere. Okay. So, the, the thing is, is that God is telling Moses, okay, here's how I created the earth. Here's how I created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, he's recounting the Garden of Eden and the creation of man. Okay? And so it's not a sequel. It's more focused in on what's going on basically on days 5 and 6. Okay? So if you look back, um, it says, God said, this is in verse 20 of chapter 1, God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth within the vault of heaven. That is the air. And so it was. And God created great sea serpents and every kind of living creature with which the waters teem and every kind of winged creature god saw that it was good god blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply upon the earth everything evening came and morning came the fifth day god said let the earth produce every kind of living creature cattle reptiles and every kind of wild beast and so it was god made every kind of wild beast every kind of cattle every kind of land reptiles god saw that it was good God said, let us make man in our own image, in the likeness of ourselves, and then let them be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the cattle, and all the wild beasts, and let, and all the reptiles that crawl upon the earth. God created man in the image of himself. In the image of God he created them. He created him. Man, male and female he created them. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and conquer it. Be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, and all the living animals on the earth. God said, see, I give you all seed-bearing plants that are upon the whole earth, and all the trees with seed-bearing fruit, this shall be your food. To all the wild beasts, all birds of the heavens, and all living reptiles on the earth, I give all the foliage of plants for food. And so it was. 
God saw that all he had made, and indeed it was very good. Evening came and morning came, the sixth day. Then he rested on the seventh. Now, in the second chapter, okay, because at the end of, well, basically, chapter two starts with, the heaven and the earth were completed with all their array. On the seventh day, God completed the work he had been doing. He rested on the seventh day after the work after all the work he had been doing, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on that day he had rested after all his work of creating. Such were the origins of heaven and earth where they were created. And then it says, At the time when Yahweh God made the earth and heaven, there was as yet no wild bush on the earth, nor had any wild plant yet sprung up, for Yahweh God had not sent rain on the earth, nor was there any man to till the soil. However, a flood was rising from the earth and watering all the surface of the soil. Yahweh God fashioned man of the dust from the soil, then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and thus the man became a living being. Yahweh God planted a garden of Eden, a garden in Eden, which is the end, which is in the east, and there he put um, the man that he had fashioned. Yahweh God caused to spring up from the soil every kind of tree, enticing to look at and good to eat, with the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. A river flowed from Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided to make four streams. So obviously he's not talking about the actual creation. What he's talking about is, is that in this one specific place, okay, where God created the Garden of Eden, he had not caused anything to grow there yet. Okay? That's what he's saying. It's basically a recap. Again, it's a recap of days six and five and six. Okay? It's just focusing in on one specific region. He's saying, okay, here, I created the heavens and the earth. Now, let me tell you how I formed man. It's not a sequel. It's not a thing. It's just God is focusing in on this part. Okay? Because he could have plants all over the world growing. Okay? And he could cause them not to grow in a specific place. Because that's where he's going to create man. That's where he's going to create animals. That's where he's going to put the man and the animals. And he's going to create a garden there. How is that hard to understand? Again, I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a theologian. I'm not anything like that. But if I can get it, then certainly IP can probably get it through his thick head. Scholars like Michael Heiser know Genesis 1 speaks of encompassing all of humanity, not just one man or one couple, implying when God made man in his image, it was meant to include all humans, wherever they were existing at that time. Then Genesis 2 picks up after this with the creation or election of two specific individuals to act as priests in the Garden of Eden. So because of the Toledoth in Genesis 2, the implication is Adam came after when all humanity was made in the image of God. No. Okay says God created man okay which again that word is called Adam okay in the image of himself God in the image of God he created him Adam male and female he created them okay and as I said before they are an image of God okay a reflection of God doesn't say it doesn't say that it's all humankind. Yes, he gives them the command, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and conquer it. He says the same thing to him, okay? I'm trying to remember where he said it to him. Outside of that, I thought he said it to him in chapter two. I 
and good, the man should be alone, I will make him a helpmate. So from the soil, Yahweh fashioned wild beasts and all the birds of the heaven. He brought to the man to see what he would call them. Each one was to bear the name of the man would give it. The man gave names to the cattle and the birds of heaven and all the wild beasts, but no helpmate suitable for the man was found. So Yahweh made man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and enclosed it in flesh. Yahweh God built the rib. And man exclaimed, At last, this is the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother to join to himself to his wife and they become one body. And both of them were naked and the man and his wife, but they felt no shame in front of each other. Um, but, I mean, that command to um, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and conquer it, that is something that is repeated many, many times. Um, in fact, it's actually told to, um, uh, let me see here. Um, I think it's in chapter 11. Well, basically, like, God, yeah, um, yeah, it's in, sorry, 9, 7. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, team over the earth, and be lord of it. God spoke to Noah and his son. See, I established my covenant with you and with the descendants after you. Okay? That is something that is that is basically told to people after that. Okay? I mean, he tells he tells Abram that, you know, that, you're going to be the father of many nations and, you know, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Okay. And, you know, he tells him, you know, and, and he says that to Isaac and he says that to Jacob. Okay. So that was definitely something that God told people all the time. Okay. So it's definitely not something that, you know, is, is doing that. And the, the problem that that I think he's having is is that because this is focusing in on one area he's trying to say well then see over here in 127 it says humanity but over here in Genesis 2 it says uh, just Adam and Eve and that they were the only ones yeah and actually science confirms that that all male Y chromosomes come from a Y chromosomal atom and that all DNA, mitochondrial DNA that comes from females goes back to a mitochondrial Eve. One man, one woman. And Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, I said Norm Jensen a few times, I apologize. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, okay, in his book Traced, he, tr he was tracing back the Y chromosomes of modern day people and he can trace them back to three people off of Noah's Ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? So, here's the point that I'm trying to make. You can't say that 27 is just talking about humanity in general, because it doesn't say it says Adam, which is man, not men. Okay? doesn't say so God created men in the image of himself or God created humanity in the image of himself it says God created man Adam okay <clears throat> we'll go back to this really fast okay I know I'm over an hour <clears throat> let me One thirty two Adam Man, human being, humankind, people, often in contrast to animals. Son of man means a human being. 
but often assumes messianic significance, i.e. But it's the same thing as um, so Adem, which is 131, okay, which goes into a bunch of other uh, similar sounding um, uh, things. Um, it says, be ruddy, be dyed red, dyed red, red, or ruddy. So Adam, okay, as we say it, Adam, not Adam, as we say Adam, it says red earth or ruddy skin color. So who we call Adam, okay, in the Bible, capitalized Adam means red earth or ruddy skin color. Okay? And so, and also... Another version of, of Adam is not in the NIV translation, but it is similar. It is a word for leather. Okay? Probably reddish in color. There's another fourth one, which means ground, which is not in the NIV. Okay? There's a fifth one that means red earth. There's another one that means ruddy skin. Okay, and then Odem, which is sort of an, a play on Adam, on Adam, okay, is ruby, which is another word for red. Okay, so basically we have five different translations. Okay, and so what's happening is, is that this guy that's reading through this, and he says, Adam means man, human being, humankind, he's thinking, oh, in Genesis 121, it means, let us make humankind in our image. But he's not making multiple people. He's making one man. Okay? So, that's the thing. Because it says, male and female, he created them. Okay? In the image of God, he created him. That him is a singular pronoun. Okay? It has nothing to do with, like, some magical humankind that he's creating elsewhere. Because he created one man and one woman. Adam and Eve. Okay? Let's go a little bit longer and then we'll call it an episode. And therefore was not the first human. Number no. five. Okay. So we're going to end it there. Um, I just wanted to get through that one part and just kind of do that, but I think you get that. Um, it, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of arrogant to think that God would go out and create a whole bunch of humans and then like, and then go and tell Moses like, oh, and Hey, by the way, like Adam and Eve are the only important ones. <laughs> okay. I don't think he did that, okay? I think he was just telling the general story of creation, and then he was like, hey, I'm now going to tell you how I created, how you know, here on the, the fifth and sixth days, okay? I'm going to tell you how I created the, the man and, and the animals and all that kind of stuff, okay? So here's how it happened. And he's focusing in more on those two days as he's creating Adam, Okay? So, honestly, I don't think that he really understands what's going on here. Okay, I think that IP is trying to eisegete very hard into the text to try to disprove the Bible and to try to make it seem like there's problems when there really isn't any problems if you bothered to read the text. Okay? I mean, especially with the whole thing about, you know, two becoming one, one flesh... Most people understand that to mean marriage. And that doesn't mean that, oh, well then, all of Genesis can just be, you know, or all of Genesis 1 through 3 can be metaphorical. No. 
Because again, it's called common sense. You can read and you can see what is clearly being told as a metaphor versus what's not being told as a metaphor. Okay? So smash that like button, hit subscribe, drop a comment below, let me know what you think of this series so far. And as we say, we will see you on the next one.